So the first talk is uh, by um, Matthew Haig, and I'm going to play the video, but he's uh, uh, online too. Okay, hello everyone. Thank you for tuning in to my talk today. My name is Matthew Haig and I'm a lecturer at Royal Holloway University of London. So the work that I'm going to be presenting today is joint work with Anthony Lin, Philip Rumer and Silin Wu, and it's called Monadic Decomposition in Integer Linear Arithmetic. So the way that I'm going to do this talk is that I'm just going to start off by presenting the results, uh, you know, in the raw form. And for people who are familiar with the area, this will be fine. For some, many of you, this will just be completely confusing. So then what I'll do is I'll go into uh, a mode where I spend a few slides explaining the definitions so you can understand the results. And then we'll look at the motivation where this kind of work came from. And then I'll try and spend some time if I, uh, just looking at how the proof works before reviewing uh, conclusions related work and so on. Okay, so let's get started. I'll just start with a quick overview of the results. So our first main result is that deciding monadic decomposability of quantifier-free Presburger formulas is an MP-complete problem. For our next result, we go a bit further than that, and instead of talking just about monadic decomposability, we actually allow, as part of the input to the problem, a partition of the variables of the formula. And given such, given such a partition, we ask, is it possible to decompose the formula along that partition? And we show that this more general problem is also NP-complete. Finally, we talk about some applications in string constraint solving, and we give some survey data showing applications of our result in that area. So that's kind of throwing the overview at you. What you probably want to see now are what these definitions mean. So, you know, what is it that I'm talking about? So the kind of basic one is quantifier-free Presburger arithmetic. So probably you know, quantifier-free Presburger is quite common, so you might be familiar with it already. But the basic idea is that we have a logical formula that has some free variables, so in this case x, y, z. And these free variables can take integer non-negative values, so 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on. And the logic formula itself is a Boolean combination of linear inequalities. So here we say x plus y is less than 4, and we comp combine it with a whole bunch of other terms that are also linear inequalities. We also have a second kind of term, which is the, the modulus terms. So here we say z is divisible by 2. So normally in Pressburger arithmetic, we don't need these modulo terms. But because we're restricting, restricting ourselves to the quantifier free fragment, it turns out that you need them. The only way of encoding them is by adding an extra existential quantifier. So we're kind of interested in logical constraints like this. And we're particularly interested in things like satisfiability. So in particular, that's an assignment to the variables that makes the formula true. So here we have one that makes the formula false. So we can see that x is 0 and z is 2. So if we do 0 minus 2 times 2, we get minus 4. And that's definitely not larger than 1. So that evaluates the formula to false. A satisfying assignment might look like this one, where we make x larger and z smaller. So quantify through Presburger is very nice, because the satisfiability problem is NP-complete. In fact, it's one of the main logics solvable by a lot of SMT solvers out there. And these SMT solvers are very useful and find applications in all kinds of areas. So it's a nice logic to be interested in. A particular kind of problem we're interested in about this logic is monadic decomposability. And what we mean about that is somehow removing dependencies. So if we have a linear inequality, we can think of that as introducing a dependency between the variables. So here we can see that this inequality combines x and y. So every time the value of x changes, the value of y also has to change. And the goal for monadic decomposition is to somehow remove these dependencies. So what I actually mean by that is that we want to rewrite the formula into an equivalent one. But the condition on this new formula should be that each term only talks about a single variable. So you can see in this formula down here, each linear inequality, or equality in this case, only talks about the variable x, or it only talks about the variable y. It never talks about the two variables at the same time. The only interaction between these variables is via the Boolean connectives. It's no longer any interaction between the uh, inside the inequalities. 
So that's kind of what we mean by monadic decomposability. We want to rewrite the formula so that each term only talks about a single variable. We generalize this to the idea of decomposing a longer partition. So what we do here is we take a, a formula again, but we, we also get given a partition. So here we have two partitions. Uh, one is, uh, contains the variables x and z, and the other contains just a variable y. And if we decompose along those partitions, then we basically say that each linear inequality only contains variables from one of those partitions. So this one only contains the variable y, so that's in the second partition. But this one contains both x and z, so it's in the first partition. Crucially, we never mix x and y or z and y. So that's a more general problem. So if you take each partition to only have a single variable, then you recover the, the straightforward monadic version, but the more general one allows much more flexibility in the partitions. So these definitions have been by example so far. If you want a more formal statement, it might look something like this, where you have a formula with three variables x1 to xn, a partition of those variables into sets of variables, and you want an equivalent formula that's a Boolean combination of subformulas, and each one of those subformulas only talks about a single one of those partitions. So that's kind of the basic definition. And now we can relook at the, uh, the results and see that if we're given a formula and we want to know if monadic decomposition is possible, then that's an MP-complete problem. Similarly, if we're given a formula and a partition, then deciding whether that partition, it's possible to decompose on that partition, that's also MP-complete. So you might probably at this point think, well, okay, you know, I'm kind of, I get the idea behind the definitions, but the motivation seems a little bit strange. So what's, why do we want, why are we interested in decomposing formulas in this way? So the reason that we came to the problem is because we're kind of researching string constraint solvers. So when we talk about string constraint solvers, what we mean is we have something very similar to Pressburger, except the variables, instead of talking about integers, we're talking about string values. So here we have a constraint that says, has the variables u, v, and w. These all have string values. We can say things like u belongs to a language L1. So in most cases, this will be a regular language. Similarly, v belongs to the regular language L2, and w belongs to the regular language L3. We don't just want to combine regular languages. We might want to say some more interesting things about strings. So in particular, we might also insist that w is the result of taking the string u, looking for all substrings of the form ABC, and replacing them with the contents of the value v. So that's just kind of a, a string operation you might apply. And the task is that we can write a constraint with these kind of terms in it, and we want to know if it's satisfiable. Now, the reason that the string constraints are interesting, and they're a very popular area of research at the moment, is because that they're kind of, much like Presburger, they're kind of useful in uh, many applications. So one such application would be a program analysis or verification using something called symbolic execution. So I won't go into too much detail about what that is, but the basic idea is that the symbolic execution engine runs all over your program, it enumerates all the paths, and along each path, it picks out a series of constraints. So you can imagine if you have an if statement in your code, that's a constraint, the, the if statement is a condition on the variables. Similarly, every time you assign a value to a variable, that's a constraint on what those values, that value of that variable can be. So it enumerates the path and it gets a series of constraints for each path. And it asks, is that a feasible path? Is it possible for the user to input some data to cause that path to be executed? And this is just a constraint problem. We want to, we get this constraint, we want to know if it's satisfiable. If it's satisfiable, that means the path is a possible execution. And if that's an error path, if that's a path that results in some kind of program crash, then we know that we found a bug in the program. Now programs, they use string variables. So some of these constraints are going to contain strings. So that's why we're interested in string constraints. So these string constraints, they're in general undecidable, but that doesn't stop people developing solvers. So there are many that exist at the moment. Some of them are incomplete, which means they just do the best they can, and they quite often give, give answers, but sometimes they just have to give up. And others are complete, but only for fragments of the string constraints, only for very specific kinds of string constraints. So in those tools, I've kind of put the, the ostrich tool in italic, because that's the tool that uh, we're, we're working on, 
and by we I mean the the authors of this work, plus uh, Talu Chen from uh, from Birkbeck. Okay, so that's um, string constraints. You might be wondering what this has to do with integer constraints in Presburg arithmetic, and the reason is because programs don't just talk about strings, or they don't just talk about integers. Usually, they talk about both. And sometimes those strings and integers actually interact with each other. So quite often you'll talk about the length of a string, or you'll talk about the index of a certain character inside a string. And this is, and the results of those functions are integers. And then you'll compare those integers with other integers, and you'll get kind of integer constraints. So usually the constraints we get are kind of a mixture of integer constraints and string constraints. Unfortunately, if we ha allow integer reasoning as well as string reasoning, it's a major cause of undecidability. So in particular, in the fragment of string constraints that are supported by our ostrich tool, if we have a single constraint that allows us to compare the length of two strings, then we get an undecidable logic. So this looks like quite bad news in terms of string constraint solving and its application in symbolic execution. However, there is one very specific instance where actually it's not quite so bad. In particular, this relates to um, a connection between Pressburger arithmetic and regular languages. So if we have a Pressburger constraint that only talks about a single variable, then it's quite well known that this Pressburger constraint can actually be turned into a regular language. And what, I mean, what I mean by that is that we can write a regular language, so L phi in this case, such that the formula phi holds over the length of a string u, if and only if the string u belongs to that regular language. So this means that if our Pressburger constraints only talk about single variables, we can actually eliminate, eliminate them from the formula and replace them with regular languages. So what, thinking about monadic decomposition, what this means is, if we, can take, if we have a Pressburger formula that talks about the lengths or the index of various characters in strings, if we're able to decompose it into a formula which just has a bunch of formulas that talk about only a single uh, component at a time, so either the length of one string or the index of a character in another string or the length of another string, if we can de decompose it so the subformulas only talk about single variables, then we can change it, we can replace it with a constraint that only talks about regular languages. And this is a big win, because that basically means our string solvers can solve it, because they know very well about regular languages. So if we're able to monadically decompose a Pressburger constraint, we can remove it from our string constraint and end up with a plain string constraint that our solvers can handle. So this is a very specific circumstance, the idea that the uh, integer constraints can be decomposed in this way. So a very valid question is whether this actually happens. So what happens in practice? Are the constraints decomposable or are they not? So using our, so in order to answer that question, we had to develop a way of testing whether a formula is decomposable. So that's the result of this work. And when we had that method, we implemented it and we did a survey of a benchmark set to see just how, how common this was. In particular, we chose the Kaluza benchmark set, which is quite a large benchmark set. It's quite a well-referenced one, so it seemed like a good one to pick out. It consists of 47,000 benchmarks, and the kind of headline figure is that 90% of those do not contain any sort of integer or length reasoning that cannot be removed from the formula. So in particular, of those 47,000 benchmarks, only 21,000 of them actually contain the string, long, string length function, so the rest are just pure string constraints. Of those 21,000 that actually talk about string lengths, 8,000 of, of them are trivial. They don't even make it to the constraint solver. They just get thrown out during pre-processing. So that leaves us with 12,000 constraints that are actually serious, that require some serious solving from a string constraint and integer solver. Fortunately for us, two thirds of them, or 8,000 of those 12,000, were actually decomposable, which meant we could decompose them into uh, uh, integer constraints that talk about single variables and then remove them from the formula. So this means that in most cases, we can actually we don't actually need to have a dedicated integer solver in our in our string constraint solver. 
However, they did, they did remain 4,000, so 4,000 out of 47,000 benchmarks where we did actually need dedicated integer solving techniques. So it's still a, a worthwhile goal to actually implement integer solving in, the, in your string solving tool. So um, another thing worth mentioning at this point is that the runtimes of our decomposability check were actually negligible. So our decomposability check runs very quickly. It's still an MP-complete problem, so it's not going to be you know, totally trivial, but it could actually be done in practice very quickly. And we'll see a little bit about why that's the case when we talk about the, the proof intuition. Okay, so that's where we are. We've defined the idea of monadic decomposition. And we've talked about how that, that can be used in the world of string constraint solving to eliminate some complication from the constraints that we're dealing with. In the time remaining, I want to just talk a little bit about the intuition behind, behind our method for detecting whether a formula is decomposable or not. So my first slide on this is actually just a bit uh, over formal. So, but the idea is that the, idea, the task of doing a monadic decomposition can actually be simplified. What this slide says is that we don't have to ask whether the whole formula is decomposable. We can actually concentrate on each individual variable at a time. So if it's possible that we can take one variable and decompose it from the rest of the formula, then if we can do that for all variables, if we can decompose each, for each variable individually, then we can do it for the whole formula. So we just remove each one variable at a time. So the kind of message of this slide is that we're going to decomp do decomposition one variable at a time. So for the rest of the intuition, we're just going to focus on a formula that has two variables and whether we can separate those two variables from each other. And this very much has the analog of removing a single variable from the formula. OK, so if we're just interested in the 2D world, that's great because we can draw graphs. So there are a few graphs in the next slides. And we're going to start by looking at some of the situations where decomposition is possible and when it's not. So a kind of very basic example of when decomposition is not possible is this formula here, x is less than y, or less than or equal to y. And the graph you get of this is basically a diagonal line that just shoots off to infinity. This diagonal line just keeps going and going and going. And this formula is not decomposable. And intuitively, the reason for that is because for every value of x, there's a different range of acceptable values for y. So when x is equal to 0, then y has to be less than 0. When x is equal to 1, then y has to be less than 1. When x is equal to 2, y has to be less than 2. So we can't decompose that formula because the value of the acceptable values for y always depend uniquely on the value of x. So if we want to decompose that into variables that only talk about a single variable at a time, we end up with infinitely many disjuncts in the formula. So this is kind of a classic example of a formula that is not decomposable. So the takeaway here is that diagonal lines are bad, but I don't want you to think that all diagonal lines are bad. It's the unboundedness of it. It's the fact that this diagonal line goes off to infinity. If we had a slightly different formula like this, then the case is not so bad. So here, x and y, the line you get is a diagonal line going downwards, and it's actually bounded by the x and y axes. So recall that our x and y variables take values greater than or equal to zero. In this case, it's still the case that every time we change x, we have to have a different value for y until we get to the point where we reach the x-axis. After that, for any value of x greater than 15, any value of y will do. So we can actually decompose that because this diagonal line is bounded. So how do we put those two things together to have a, an algorithm? So the first observation is that a Pressburger formula in DNF is just a union of convex holes. So what I mean by that is here we have part of a Presburger constraint. It's just the intersection of three lines. So I've drawn these three lines on the graph and shaded the region, which is accepted by that, that uh, part of the formula. So this is a conjunction of, of lines. And then we're going to disjunct that with another conjunct of lines. And we get another section of the graph, another hull on the graph. So all Pressburger formulas can be thought of, the, of this in this way. as just a union of convex hulls, a union of intersections of lines. So you might notice at this point that this graph's getting kind of complicated. There's all these lines crossing over each other. It's a bit of a mess around here. Fortunately for us, this kind of complicated region is actually bounded. So there's only a certain amount of the, the graph where all of this line crossing is taking place. 
And although it looks complicated, it's actually, it is actually the simplest thing, part of monadic decomposability. Because within this region, we can just simply enumerate all of the values that uh, are accepted and ignore all the ones that are not. So back then I just highlighted the fact that these lines also include the crossing points, also include the crossing points for the axes. So this part of the formula is complicated, but we can enumerate it because it's a finite region. If we're worried about decomposability, the tricky part is actually everything that happens outside of all of the crossing points, outside of this bounded region. In particular, we're worried about diagonal lines that reach out to infinity. So it's the case that if we have a diagonal line that reaches out to infinity, it will at some point end up in this top corner here. So this top corner here is somehow the danger zone. This is where we might detect that we have a, a line that's going to infinity. So here you can see that we have two lines. This dashed line here is actually, it's a line that goes to infinity, but it's not actually important. We can see that whichever side of the line you're at doesn't affect whether you're satisfying the formula or not. However, down here, on this part here, this line is actually a boundary. If we're on one side of the line, we're accepted. If we're on the other, we're not accepted. So this is a diagonal line that shoots off to infinity and it actually affects the outcome of the formula. So it's what we call a bad, it's a bad diagonal line. So if we want to witness non-decomposability, we have to witness the existence of a line like this. And to do that, we can actually just, all that we need to do is identify any two points in this top corner, such that one of them is accepted and one of them is not accepted. If that's the case, then it must be the fact that there is a diagonal line that separates these two points. And that diagonal line must go all the way to infinity, which means that our formula is not decomposable. So using that intuition, we can have a simple test for decomposability that simply says, look for two points, so two values of x, and we can actually fix the value for y. So look for two points in this top corner up here, such that one of them is accepted by the formula and one of them is not. If we can do that, then we have a witness for non-decomposability. There's also an extra term here, which is same div. So this is just here to deal with the divisibility constraints. So we won't worry too much about that. So that's the case for monadic decomposition. If we want to generalize this to uh, the partition, like partitioning, uh, doing a decomposition by a partition, then the formula is pretty much the same. It's just that this divisibility part becomes same region. And this idea of a region just encompasses the kind of linear inequalities that use some of the variables, but not all of them. So this is a bit more complicated to define, but the intuition remains the same. Okay, so that was the brief intuition. So just to conclude. So we've provided an MP completeness proof for both monadic decomposability and decomposability along a given partition of the variables. And this is for quantifier fee Presburger formulas. We've also implemented our algorithm for doing this. And we've done a survey of the Kaluza benchmarks and showed that in many cases, constraints are decomposable. And this has applications to string constraint solving. I haven't mentioned any related work, so I should mention that uh, Marcus Wiens et al. They've done a lot of work about monadic decomposability for SMT. And this is in the context of symbolic transducers and string analysis. And one contribution they have is a generic semi-algorithm for finding decompositions. The problem has also been studied by Leonard Lipkin back in 2003, and he gives a general condition for decomposability. So this is for any kind of logic, you can detect whether decomposition is possible, but the complexity is higher than ours. It's a general algorithm, but it's not optimal complexity wise. In terms of future work, then one obvious problem is how, if we know that formula is decomposable, how can we calculate a good one? If you remember from the intuition, we were literally just enumerating all of a bounded region. So this actually gives you an exponentially large formula. Can we do better than that? Another interesting problem is, can we, we've always assumed that we've been given the partition along which we want to decompose. And we want to know what is the complexity of finding a partition. So there's a trivial sigma P2 upper bound, but we don't have a lower bound that's above NP. So that's an interesting problem. We also might want to decompose more rich classes of Presburger, such as existential Presburger, for example. Okay, thank you for the time. I've run over a little bit, but now I have time for questions. Thank you. All right. So there's like one one question in the chat, question and answer session. 
Okay, hi Matt. So I'd like to ask about the fact that you said that if you have one one variable formula, you can represent it with a regular language. Mm -hmm. So you cannot do it with more than one variable. So the question is like, usually if you encode Pressburger into regular languages, you're doing this automata construction when you have the binary encoding and you can have a relation among arbitrary many variables, right? So can you comment on that? The encoding is kind of different, right? Or was the... Uh, yeah, so actually that is possible. You can do it like that. So you can encode pretty much any Pressburger in some regular way. Uh, the problem is for our fragment, when we try and use that kind of encoding in our string constraints, it, it doesn't work with the conditions we need to maintain decidability. So it's possible, but it doesn't help us in solving the string constraints. Whereas, the, yeah, in the, one val in the one variable case, it's just a, a regular language and we can deal with that. Otherwise, you have a kind of regular relation, which is more complicated. OK, thanks. There are other questions? So I would have a question. So this uh, benchmark set Kalusa. So you said like uh, only very tiny fraction, like uh, you said 12K are uh, actually sort of interesting for you. And then among those, like 4K cannot be handled. Um, so is it clear that this, this benchmark set is not biased towards sort of like uh, existing um, sort of solution, like a uh, solving technology, sort of like people only submitted benchmarks, which in principle can be solved by existing tools? So, so of course, like well, in, in some sense, I'm asking if you would really apply this, say, with a company on 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 checking their code, you might get completely different benchmarks. Yeah, I think that it, there's that is true. I think there are some kind of reservations a bit about the Kalusa benchmark set, and it's been it's quite it's quite old now, I think, and people it doesn't contain maybe as much as people would like it to contain. Uh, but we chose it just because it's the biggest one that we kind of have. So yeah, maybe if we. Uh, collected more benchmarks from somewhere, I'm not sure where, then that would- What happens, okay. Us. Yeah, we'd, it's a good question, but I don't know the answer, sorry. Okay, are there, there other questions? So I have a second one, if there's no other one. So so this, uh, um, uh, when you can translate like one of these uh, uh, integer problems into um, regular language checks. So what's the technology behind this regular language checks? Do they kind of use model checking or what do they use? Um, yeah, that's actually an interesting question. So in terms of the um, Ostrich tool, we're just doing something very simple, like simply just doing reachability over automata. And there's uh, the guy who developed the Quizzy tool, uh, Arlen Cox, I think. He actually had some problems that were very heavy on regular language text. And he discovered that, you know, our string constraint solver and many others are, are very poor at, at this. So and they, these, these, are, these are explicit model checkers, I guess. Explicit yeah, model yeah checkers. exactly. Okay. No, so no he, symbolic ones? Um, I don't know off the top of my head, actually, which ones he looked at. So his tool definitely, Quizzy, does a much more symbolic, he uses proper symbolic oh. techniques, and that does much better. Ah, OK, I see. So there's definitely scope for improving our tool, Ostrich, and many others with uh, some, some much more advanced regular checks. Uh, for the benchmarks we had when we built the tool, it didn't actually matter too much. But uh, yeah, certainly if you ex go beyond our benchmarks, you can run into problems. OK, so we still have time for one more question, if there's any. Otherwise, let's thank the speaker. <laughs>